Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Hi, I'm Jackie Lynch, and in this session, we're going to talk about NIM, the Network and Store Manager, and this is a basic level presentation. On the slide, you'll see the link that's for the handout if you'd like to download a copy of this presentation. During this presentation, we're going to do somewhat of an introduction to NIM. We'll talk about NIM resources and setting up NIM. And we'll talk about things like clients and stores. And then I'll try to finish up with some hints and tips. So let's start with what is NIM? NIM is basically a central point of management for doing installation and maintenance of AIXL PARs and VIO servers. You can use it for standalone servers, you can use it for LPARs on a server, and as I said, VIOs. Typically, what you would do is create a golden image, image and you can clone LPARs from that. You can use it to install software or updates. You can restore from Makesys B backups. You can add bundles of products and you can do multiple installations at the same time. Installations and updates can be done with a push or a pull. A push being where the NIM server pushes it out to the client and a pull being where the client requests it from the NIM server. NIM installations are very quick. If you're installing from DVD, by the time you do all your customizations and everything, it can be anywhere up to eight hours till you're finished. With NIM, that's more like 15 minutes. The other advantage of NIM is it allows you to take clones to an alternate disk. It also lets you do updates and disk installations to an alternate disk so that the running system is not impacted by whatever it is that you're doing. So let's talk about what you need to have a NIM environment. And there are three components, the master, the client, and the network. So the master is the NIM server or LPAR itself. This is where you actually install NIM services and it will own and provide any of the resources that you need to be able to install or update clients. It stores information about the clients and any resources that those clients need. And it keeps a form of a database which needs to be backed up. The actual client is going to be defined as a machine and it could be standalone, which can be a server of some kind or it can be an LPAR. You can also do system WPARs as clients, and then you can have diskless and dataless clients where they actually boot from the NIM server. And finally, the network. The network has to be able to support NFS, and it uses a NIM SH instead of RSH ever since AIX 5.3. If you happen to be someone that uses TCP wrappers, you cannot have TFTP and boot PD, which are two of the protocols that are used by the NIM master, those cannot be wrapped. When you're setting up your NIM server, there's a couple of things you need to be aware of. The first thing is that the AIX on the NIM server has to be at the highest level of AIX you plan to support. So in order to support the latest VIO and AIX LPARs, you would need to be at AIX 4.3.2.2. If your NIM server is not a dedicated server, if it's an LPAR, then what you need to do for that LPAR is give it dedicated resources. It should not get its resources from the VIO servers since one of the things that you plan to do with that NIM server is be able to install and recover VIO servers. So it should have its own fiber card to the SAN and it should have its own network card. You also need to plan for memory. Typically, it doesn't need much more than about 8, 8 to 16 gig is what I would say nowadays, and it only needs about a half a core with two VPs. You're going to create a volume group for NIM itself outside of root VG. I typically call it NIM VG, and that should be created as a scalable volume group because it may end up holding a lot of files and some very large files since backups can be much larger than four gig. You should never put your NIM resources into root VG because they will be large, they will fill it, and that is not something you want. I typically create a file system called slash NIM and NIMVG, and everything that's part of my NIM environment goes in there. I also create a separate file system for Maxis B images called slash backups, and I'll explain later on why I don't put those in slash NIM. The file sets that you're going to need are going to be boss.sysmanagement.nim.master, boss.sysmanagement.nim.spot, 
and boss.sysmanagement.nim.client. And then you've also got to make sure that you have a TCP and NFS server file sets installed. And nowadays in AIX, those are separate, so you do need to double check on them. And you could do that using the LSLPP command. NIM can be pretty finicky. And in particular, it does not like you to use a dot or period in a resource name. So you would need to use underscore. So instead of AIX72 dot makes this be, it would be AIX72 underscore makes this be. In order to set up NIM, you're going to need an AIX DVD or the ISO image. And you'll basically run the NIM master setup command and either point it to the actual device, which is the CD drive, or to a directory where you have loaded all of the images from the ISO for the installation. When you run that NIM master setup, it's going to create a file system called slash TFTP boot. And it will create a very basic spot and LPP source. And we'll go into those in a minute. And as you can see, I pointed it to my file system of slash NIM and to the volume group NIMVG. And there's a specific directory structure that NIM uses. So slash NIM is the base. Then there's an LPP source directory, an images directory, which is where all your images that you would use, like makes the speeds would go, a spot, a Boston data, and a resolve.conf, and we will talk about each of those. So if we look at my setup on my AIX 7.3 system, you can see the OS level is 7.3.2.2. If I do an LSLPP and search on BOSS Sys Management NIM, you can see the client, the master, and the spot. And a DF-G of slash NIM shows that I've got 450 gig. You may need more than that, depending on how many LPARs you have to restore support and also on how many spots and LPP sources and different levels that you need to be able to ha have around. And then if I do an ls-al on slash nim, you can see I've got a boss since data, images, LPP source, resolve.conf and spot directory. A couple of other things that you need to check. You need to make sure that any servers or LPARs that you plan to support are either in your slash etc slash hosts or if you do an NS lookup, that they can be resolved by DNS. The second thing you need to do, and this is on the NIM master, you need to check inetd.com and make sure that you have both bootps and TFTP uncommented. For security reasons, you can leave them commented out most of the time and just uncomment them and refresh inetd whenever you want to use them, but they do need to be there and you do need to have them uncommented when you're trying to use NIM. So there are quite a few different NIM resources. The first one, the primary one, is machines. When they refer to machines in NIM, they're talking about the actual individual LPARs or clients or servers that we're going to be supporting. Then we have the LPP source, and the LPP source is created from the installation CD or DVD or from an ISO image. And it's basically all the .bff files that exist on those CDs. So if you're working from the ISO image, you would do a SPDI BFF create, put them all in one directory. And then when you create the LPP source, you would point to that directory as the source. After the LPP source is created, you're going to create something called a spot or shared product object tree. And this is used similar to how a boot image and installation script is used. For both spots and LPP sources, you would typically have a separate one for each OS version. I, I tend to have a separate one for each OS maintenance level, etc. So I would have one for 7.2.5.8, 7.2.5.6, 7.3.2.2, .2 and so on. And then a makes a B resource, which lives in slash nim slash images, is basically where you would put the makes us bees that you want to be able to restore from. So the NIM master can use an LPP to install, or it can actually install the instance from a Maxis B. And once the Maxis B is restored, you can run scripts to customize the instance. The one difference is with a VIO server, you can restore that from a Maxis B or a spot. There is no LPP source associated with VIO server. 
So once you've defined the machines, the next step is going to be creating LPPs and spots. Now, I prefer to use the ISO images that you can download from IBM's ESS website rather than using DVDs because I can save those ISO images on my computer and I don't have to take up a bunch of storage space. So I would load that ISO image and I would then use Smitty BFF Create to create a source directory, which I always call da dash base, containing those images. So if you look at the line where I'm creating an LPP source, I'm doing a NIM minus O define of an LPP source. The actual source is going to be slash user local software AIX72, AIX72 TL5 SPA 2420 base. That is the location and directory that I use Smitty BFF create to put the images from the ISO into. I'm telling it to use packages equals all, and then I'm telling it where to create the LPP which is slash nim LPP source and then the LPP name and then you say the LPP name again and that's what it will record it as. If I have additional packages or patches or anything that I want to put on, I can put those in different directories and I can use nim minus o update. So here I'm updating the LPP with some add-ons. I've got a fix, fix 72 that I'm putting on. I'm updating SSH, SSL, Java. I always patch those because they're never up to date on whatever comes out. And then I can actually use show res to actually check that certain things are there. Like I want to check the boss.net's properly in there and boss.alt.disk. So this is showing me that in my 7258 LPP, I have boss alt disk install boot images and boss alt disk install RPE. And then I run a nim minus o check to make sure there are no issues with that LPP. We go through the same process with the spot. Now this is for AIX. So here I'm defining my spot and I define it with the source being the LPP. And it will take that LPP and it will create a spot and slash nim slash spot. I then check it. Um, quite often the spot doesn't end up with the boss alt disk install boot images in it. So I sometimes will have to do a nim minus o cust and tell it to actually install that again from the LPP source. And then I'll do a nim minus o show res and check that it actually does exist in the spot. There are many cool things that you can do with nim, but one that I have used extensively is the ability to take a makesysb of a system that I need to upgrade and create a new makesysb that's at the upgraded level. And the way that works is, in this case, it's an AIX71 system. I can copy that original makesysb into NIM images and create a resource for it. Then I can use NIM ADM to say, take that makesysb, which is the one that ends 2417, create a new makesysb in slash NIM slash makesysb slash XX makesysb SEP22024 and apply the contents of the spot and LPP for 7258 and upgrade that old H makes a speed to this new one. I can use list VG backup to make sure that certain files are there. And then when I'm ready to deal with it, I would allocate the LPP and spot and makes a speed to my server, which is Gandalf. I'll then set up the LPAR using Smitty NIM or NIM minus OBOS inst to actually do a makes a speed install. I'll double check a couple of things. I'll check that slash TFTP boot has the right files in it. I will do a tail on slash etc slash boot ptab to make sure that the uh, IP addresses, etc. appear in there. And I'll do a show mount dash e to make sure that the files that I need are actually exported. I always take a copy of the new makes a speed of my slash backups just in case. Now what I can do is I can get onto the running client and I can actually tell it to do a restore of that upgraded makes a speed to hdisk 11 using this alt disk makes a speed, point it at slash backups in the new makes a speed and tell it to put it on hdisk 11. I can then run a boot list and set it to point to hdisk 11 and then I can reboot and it should come up on the upgraded one. 
So this slide is just showing you the contents of the various NIM directories. So you can see my LPP source contains two LPP sources, one for AIX 7.2.5.8 and one for AIX 7.3.2.2. You'll see my spot has four resources. It has the two for AIX, and then it has two spots that are specific to VIO servers, the most recent one being for 4.1.0.21. As I mentioned earlier, there is no LPP for a VIO server, and you should never, ever, ever try to update or install a VIO server from an AIX LPP. And then if you look in slash nim slash images, you'll see the old makes this be from 2017. And in slash nim slash makes this be, I've got the old makes this be, and I've got the brand new one that I just created. And this is last thing is just showing you that my NIMVG is a two disk volume group. As I mentioned earlier, I always set my NIM volume group up as a scalable volume group. And I typically set a PP size of 5112 megabytes or 1024 megabytes. That's because it tends to be a large file system. And then if you look at my LSVG, what I ha typically have in there is slash NIM and slash TFTP boot. Sometimes if I've got enough disk space, I'll have slash backups and slash software in there. But it just depends on what structure you want to use to set yours up. So there are some additional NIM resources. Uh, you can actually have scripts which can be set to run during an installation or after an installation to do some customizations. They could be security requirements, automatic installation of third party software, customizations related to paging or dump space and so on. So on. A BOSINCE data is actually a file, not a directory. And it contains the information to let the installation take place without you having to respond to all of the prompts. It defines defaults like disk drives, the type of installation, and so on. There's also an image data file, and this is quite important because it has to do with information about file systems and things like mirroring. So if you're doing a make this be of a mirrored system, there are things you could do in the image data file so that you can restore it to a single disk system. And then there's something called install P bundles. This is where you can put together a bunch of additional software, for instance, for DB2 or for Oracle that you would automatically install after you've installed the operating system. So it just bundles those things together. One of the first resources you're gonna set up is the client machine information. And in order to do that, there's some fields you have to fill in when you're in NIMP. One is the hardware type, which is always going to be CHIRP, C-H-R-P. And then there's going to be the kernel, which today on AIX version 6 and higher is going to be MP64 bit. There's going to be a cable type, and typically that is going to be TP. B and C is what you would use for like a copper connection, but I've never seen anything other than TP in recent years. You don't have to fill in the network adapter hardware address. It's better to um, specify the IP parameters on the SMS menus during a client boot. You can specify them here if you want. And if the NIM client and NIM master are on different IP subnets, you must specify them. Typically, it's going to grab most of the information out of uh, Etsy hosts or from DNS, and then it will ask you for additional things. And you can also have machines register themselves. So I can be logged on to a running AIX instance. And I can basically do a Smitty NIM init and tell that client to register itself to my NIM master. The LS NIM command actually lists all the resources that are defined. So this is a subset of what I typically have. So you can see I have a master, I have a boot resource, I have a NIM script. Um, it always, the first network it defines is the master net. And then you can see I've got a, a boss inst. So the 7300-00 bid OW, the LPP res and spot, are the ones that it default, defines by default when you create the NIM master. Same with that basic res group. And then additional resources are added as you define them. So you can see I've got my two VIOs and my one server. Then I have my LPPs and spots. And you can see I also have a Maxis B image for one of my VIO servers. 
Now, typically on a NIM system, you're going to have a lot more than those. I just basically copied and pasted a few that, to show you what they might look like. So this is an example when I do a show mount minus E, you can see what I'm exporting out to my server, Gandalf. Uh, so none of the NIM stuff is really being exported right now, apart from Gandalf.script. If I do an ls-nim-l on Gandalf, it actually tells me that it's a machine, that it's using NIMSH, it's using that hardware platform Chirp, 64-bit kernel, and it tells me what its current state is, which is that it's running. And it also gives me the CPU ID. And that CPU ID will be very useful later on. So there are a couple of ways that you can install or update resources. And one is using the GUI, and the other is using the nim-o command. So we'll put our update CD into the system, or we'll change into the fixes or updates directory. And if we want to update a spot in our LPP source, we would go into Smitty NIM, perform NIM administration tasks, manage resources, perform operations on resources, and then in this case, I would select the spot, I would select update all, and I would point it to the update CD or the directory, and then it would update it. Alternatively, I can use the NIM minus O update packages equals all, point it to the directory, tell it the LPP that I want to update. Um, and then if I want to just define the and build the initial LPP, I've got the NIM minus O define command that's at the top. As I said, a spot's typically defined from an LPP, although it can be updated separately. And we always run the NIM minus O check on the spot in the LPP. Now, sometimes when you're partway through a NIM install, the, the LPP might hang or something might happen, and you may have to do a NIM minus O reset minus A force equals yes on the server to get it back to a status where you can start the NIM install. So that's a good command to be aware of. If you want to set up a client to restore from a Maxis B, the first thing you have to do is to make sure the client's an Etsy host or in DNS and that the name can be resolved. Then you're going to create the client machine to NIM as a machine object. So we'll do that with Smitty NIM, perform administrative tasks, manage machines, and then we're going to define a machine. And you know, setting the parameters for the kernel, NIM shell, and the network interface. You may or may not want to use an image data file. The kind of things that you can put in the image data file are telling it not to shrink file systems, not to do an exact fit. You can tell it things like copies equals one, two, or three, depending on whether you want to be mirroring it. Um, you can also put similar things with for LPs and PPs. If you don't specify an image data resource, then NIM is going to use the file that's embedded in the MakesSSB image. And that's when you can run into trouble if you did a MakesSSB of a mirrored system, but you're trying to restore to a non-mirrored system. Using this image data file will allow you to override that. And at the very top, you can see the link for a template. So typically, you would copy that and then modify it. So you need to copy the MakesSSB image that you want to restore from into slash nim slash images, and then you need to create a MakesSSB resource, which is typically from Smitty NIM. You go in and you manage resources, define the resource. You tell it you're creating a MakesSSB resource, give it a name, and then put the location in. The other way you can do it is with the nim minus o define command, and I've put that there to show you. So there's two different ways of creating the MakesSSB as a resource, but they both depend on the MakesSSB image having been copied into slash nim slash images prior. At this point, you could tell nim to use that MakesSSB for a specific machine. So I go into Smitty Nimboss Inst, I select my server, which in this case is Gandalf. I tell it that the install source is this particular MakesSSB. And I select the spot, the makes this B image, and typically I also select the LPP. Sometimes I actually go in ahead of times and I actually use NIM minus O allocate and I allocate them. And then when I do the Smitty NIM boss since they're already there. 
I tell it yes to accept licenses and I always tell it no to initiate now. What that means is I want to make it a pull resource. So if I leave that set to yes, it will immediately reboot the client and try to do the install. And I might not want to do it right now. So I typically set initiate now to no and then I boot the client into SMS mode when I'm ready and tell it to do an install from the NIM server. So you have both the GUI way of doing it here and you also have the commands down the bottom. And this slide is just showing you from the GUI what it looks like when you are filling in all those fields, the initiate boot operation, remaining a NIM client, accepting a new license agreement, etc., etc. At this point, I would do a couple of checks. First thing I do is a show mount minus E, and I would expect to see the, the uh, LPP source, the spot, and the Maxis B all exported individually to Gandalf. I would also cat slash etc slash boot p tab, and I'm looking for a line similar to this bottom line, which says um, in, in slash TFTP boot, there'll be a Gandalf directory, um, and my IP is this, my, my gateway, etc. those will typically be specified. When I look in TFTP boot, you'll see that I have a TFTP boot slash Gandalf, and then there's also a Gandalf.info, there's an IPL record, there's some ENT information. All of those have to be there, otherwise when you go to do the, the pull, it won't be able to find them because it uses TFTP to, go, to get to those. And as you can see, there's also some spot information. I also check to see if, if the boss.alt disk install boot images, etc., are actually in the LPP and spot. And, and those are going to be needed in order for this to work. So just double check that they're there. I if I'm actually trying to do this using NIM ADM and I'm putting it to an alternate disk, I need to make sure that the LPAR is actually running NIM. And sometimes it isn't. So if you do a PS-EF grep NIM and you don't see um, NIM client running, then you can start it with the start source-G. And now from the NIM server, you can issue a command just to check that NIM is actually working. So something like a NIM-O and then a command, whether it's a DF, Alice LPP, um, and then send it to the LPAR and, you know, do a grep on something. If it fails, you could check this nimsh.log file. And if you see a line that says error local volume passed and there's like a, a bunch of stuff that looks like a CPU ID, basically that means that the CPU ID NIM thinks is there for the LPAR is incorrect. That happens when you've been doing LPMs. If you have shut an LPAR down, brought it up on another server, those kind of things will, because NIM, when it creates the machine, stores the CPU ID. If you then move that LPAR to other servers, NIM won't necessarily know about it. So the way around that, if you run into it, is you run uname minus A on the client to get the CPU ID. And then on the NIM LPAR, you reset the CPU ID using the new one you just found. And then your command should actually work. So there are a few commands that are not always used but can be useful and one of them is this ability to recover s images so occasionally an, an lpp won't have the recovery equals yes parameter set it's very rare but it used to happen quite a bit if that happens and you can tell because when you run the ls nim minus l on it it says there's no s images so you can run the nim minus o update with recover equals yes against that LPP and it will correct that problem. This is there's also the commands here for deallocating spots and LPPs and makes us bees from an LPAR, as well as allocating them. And then I've also got a, the syntax for the NIM minus O boss inst. All of these you can do through the GUI, but I just wanted to have them in there. Now if you wanted to install specific file sets, you can actually use nim-o update and specify the package instead of packages equals all. And again, the source. In this case, I'm using the CD, but it could just as easily be an ISO image or it could be the directory that has all the base code in it. 
and you also have the ability to remove images. So here I'm removing boss.games. If you've allocated things to an LPAR and enabled it for installation and you've changed your mind for whatever reason, that's when you might have to use the nim o reset command. And you can also use the nim o deallocate command to then deallocate all the resources. And we already talked about the ability to change the CPU ID if you need to do so. So in this slide, we're looking at what we have to do to do what I call a pull install. In this case, I boot the client into SMS mode after I've done all the previous preparation. I select two for a setup remote IPL, and then I select my Ethernet adapter. Um, in this case, I've only got one port, so it was easy. Um, I select IP version 4, boot P, and then I have to fill in the parameters, which is the client IP that you're going to be putting on that client, the NIM master IP. If they're on the same subnet, you don't need to fill in the gateway. If they're on different subnets, you may need to fill in the gateway and then the subnet mask. You can then go and select two for adapter config and select, I normally disable spanning tree because that can speed things up. The other thing that you can look at is protocol and that's if it's aggregated, then you may need to change that from standard to something else. I've had issues with doing NIM installs over aggregates, but if you change that protocol, you should be able to get around it. And then finally, we do a ping test and, and then one to execute a ping test to make sure that we can communicate. And if the ping test is successful, you go back to the main menu. Now, just because the ping test is successful does not mean that your install will work. But if the ping test is not successful, it absolutely won't work. Because one of the things that can impact you where the ping test might work is that if there's a firewall in between the LPAR and the NIM server, then you can run into issues where they have boot P and TFTP blocked. So that's just something to watch out for. Now we get at the main menu, we select boot options. We select our boot device, which is the network boot P. Again, we're selecting the same Ethernet adapter we selected up above. We tell it to do a normal boot. And then we tell it, yes, I want to exit. At this point, the LPAR should boot and you should see TFTP start up. Somewhere around 30,000 to 50,000 packets, the console prompt should appear. And what I have found is it goes through a boot PTFTP loop and it goes through it twice. So don't be surprised if that happens. Once it comes up with the console prompt, you're going to hit F1 and enter for console. You'll use one for English unless you want a different language. Sometimes you'll get an error message that says all LVs are being created exactly as they were, but the disks are not the same. Um, I, I normally go ahead with choosing one to continue with install. I then check the install settings. I make sure that there's only one disk that's chosen and that it's the correct one for root VG. So in this case, I chose H disk zero. I don't tend to choose um, any maps for installation. Um, and I don't have it import other volume groups. And then I have zero to continue with choices. If you're using a mirrored system and you didn't use a custom image data file, then you're going to have to pick two disks to restore to. So just be aware of that. And then after the system reboots, you can import your volume groups, remirror root VG, perform any further tailoring and so on. So after the reboot, your installation should start. You can monitor it from the NIM server using LSNIM, space minus L, space, whatever the LPAR is called. And you can see how far it's gone. I actually tend to SSH to the HMC and I use VT menu. And I just sit there on the console on the LPAR so that I can watch what's happening. And this slide just has a bunch of useful commands that you should put off to the side because you, you may find that they're useful as you're moving forward and doing things with NIM. And this is showing the output from the Alice NIM command on a couple of different makes of speeds. Uh, the one on the left is the AIX71 LPAR. And you can see that that makes of speed was taken at 7.1.4.3. And then 
this is going back a little bit, but this uh, this is where I created the new one, and you can see that the new makes this B is actually at 7.2.1. So that's one of the useful things for that lsnib command. This slide is showing you the output of the lsnim command against an LPP. So you can see that it's ready for use and what the location is. And you can see that that S images is set to yes, which is what you need to see for an LPP. This NIM on the spot provides a little bit more information. It provides you with the location, but it also provides you with the version release and modification level. So you can see that this particular spot is for 7.2.1.2. So on both the NIM master and the clients, there's going to be a file called NIM info. On the master, if you do an LS on it, you'll find it here. And then if you cat it, you'll see some parameters in there, in there, specifically the NIM name, the configuration, what the master and registration ports are. So those two ports are really important because those are the ports that need to be open on the firewall in order for NIM to be able to communicate. The other directory you need to be aware of is this etc obs repos. Now, you'll hear people talk about the NIM database. It's not actually a database. It's just a bunch of files, and these are the files that we're talking about. So it's always good to periodically take a copy of those files, and that's what we talk about when we talk about backing up the NIM database. Basically, in terms of backing up that NIM database, we back up those four files out of Etsy Obs Repos, and we also back up our NIM info file. And with those files, you can actually recreate and reactivate a NIM master if you need to do so. If you lose your Etsy, your Etsy NIM info file on the master, you can actually rebuild it using the NIM config command, and it will actually rebuild it based on the information that it finds. You can also rebuild it from a running NIM client by using NIM inits and filling in the various fields here. And then one of the things you should do on the master is make sure that NIM itself is starting. So typically in etc init tab, you should see a line that's like NIM colon two, and it's gonna start source dash G space NIM. On the clients, they're typically gonna start source dash G space NIM client. So just be aware of those. This is what your NIM info file is going to look like on your client. And again, you can see the master port, the registration port, the shell, the NIM master ID. That's the CPU ID for the NIM master. So if you ever move your NIM master, you're going to have to update the CPU ID. It's got a bunch of other things in here. And you can see that it's got an export NIM hosts. It's got NIM images, basically anything that's going on. These, they're going to end up being recorded in here. So this is an important file. If you lose it, you're going to have to recreate it. I typically keep a copy of the NIM info for each of my clients on a separate system. It's important to understand the difference between a migration and an update. So a migration is when you change version or release. So going from 7.2 to 7.3 or going from 6.1 to 7.2. That's a migration. An update is when you're preserving a version and release. So you're basically putting on a technology level or a service pack. Both migrations and updates can use alternate copies of root VG if you have an unused disk available. And I highly recommend that you always have an unused disk available because whenever I make changes, I always take a clone to a second disk so that to recover, all I have to do is boot from the original disk that's unchanged, which is what the one that is in the now in the clone. You could do your updates a couple of different ways. You can use NIM to update it on the copy of the disk, or you could take a copy to that disk and update it on the current copy and then reboot, which means that the clone is still untouched. It's, you could do either way works. So you should always migrate or update your NIM master first. It has to be at the highest level. And then you create the LPP sources and spots for the new level. If your NIM master is at 7.2.5.8, you can't create an LPP source or spot for 7.3.2.2.
you have to be on 7.3.2.2 in order to do that. You can use NIMADM, which we're going to discuss in a minute, for migrations to install a down level makes this be and then migrate it or to install a new golden image and for a whole host of other things. You can use NIMOLT clone with update all if you want to update a TL or SP. And then there's also something called multiboss that we will talk about uh, later on. The NIMADM is your friend. It lets you do a number of things. You can take a copy of your current root VG to a free disk and migrate it to a new version or release level of AIX at the same time. You could take a copy of root VG and create a new NIM makes us be resource that's been migrated to the new version. So it's basically the same as step one, except it's going, instead of putting it on the other disk, what it's going to do is it's going to create a fresh makes us be that you can use later on. And you can take a makes us be and restore it to the free disk. And then when you're ready, you can reboot. There's a number of different things that you can do. But what NIMADM allows you to do is do it to an alternate disk rather than touching the live disk. So in this example, my current operating system level is 7.2.5.7. .7, and I've got two disks. One is root VG, the other one's called alt inst root VG. So the first thing I do is I export alt, root, alt inst root VG. So what I want to do is I want to take a copy of my current root VG, create a new makes this be resource that's been migrated. And that's not going to touch the other disk. So here you can see, and this is the example I had earlier where I take the old makes this be, create a new one and apply a spot in an LPP, etc. Now this would be on my NIM master, whereas the 7257 is the client. All right. I can also use a copy of root VG on that client to create an upgraded copy on the spare disk. So I can tell it to NIM ADM and use this LPP and spot, but write it all out to HDisk1. And that's what that is doing. And I can also tell it to use NIMADM and take the makes this be that I created and update it and put it on HDisk1. So there's three different ways to do it. The dash capital Y says agree to the software licenses, which you need to do. Capital V is verbose mode. I always use verbose mode. And then the dash capital N when you see it is where you're going to actually be writing it to a new makes this be versus writing it to a disk. One thing to watch with NIMADM is that it will always set the boot list to the new HDisk. So if I do a boot info, um, I booted from HDisk1. If I had done boot list minus M normal minus O, it would be showing me HDisk1. After the NIMADM, it's now showing me HDisk0, which is what I did my update to, and I don't want to boot from HDisk0. I want to... I, I want to control when I do that reboot. So always check the boot list before and after you do a NIMADM and make sure that at the end it is set to where you want it to be. The NIMALT clone is the GUI interface that uses the alt disk copy command. And what we use alt disk copy to do is take a copy of your current root VG and clone it to another disk, which will end up being called alt inst root VG. So in this case, I am copying my current root VG, which I happen to know is on HDisk0. I'm doing it in verbose mode so that I see any errors. I'm telling it with the dash capital B that I do not want it to change the boot list. If you don't put that, it will change the boot list to the disk you're copying to. And the new disk that is going to is HDisk2. HDisk2 cannot have a volume group on it. I then always do a boss boot and rewrite the boot list for the current root VG. I tend to do that whenever I'm doing maintenance, just to make sure that there's not an issue. And basically, on my client, I'm going to unmirror root VG, clean up, boss boot, boot list M. This is what I do before I do maintenance. And then I'll take a clone. I can use Smitty Alt clone from the master, or I can use Alt disk copy locally. And I'm telling it to basically take that clone. In this case, I'm actually telling it that 
I want to do an update all and I'm going to point to the fixes that I want to install, point to an LPP source, accept licenses. This lets me do a clone and update. So I'm telling it, take a clone and then apply all these fixes and put them on the clone. And then when I'm done, I'm going to boot from the alt instrument VG, which means I need to set the boot list. And then if I have a problem, my reboot is basically setting my boot list back to hdisk zero in this case and reboot. So it makes it much easier to fail back and it is much quicker than doing a restore. Alternate disk install is basically the process of taking an old clone and then doing all your updates to that copy and then you reboot. So one of the things that you do have to have on your clients is this boss alt disk install RTE, which I mentioned earlier. And then basically you follow the steps, do the update. And when you're happy, you update the boot list and reboot. And again, as I said, if you are having problems with the NIM ADM, you can create a migrated makes this be, copy it to the client and use alternate disk install to restore that makes this be on a separate disk. So you have lots of different ways to get that data to that second disk. So going back quite a ways, the alt disk install command has actually been replaced by alt disk copy, alt disk makes this be, and alt root vg op. And there are very, very good man pages on all of those. So on this slide, what you can see is I did an LSPV and you can see my HDisk 0 is my root VG and HDisk 1 is set to none. They're both virtual SCSI disk drives. And then I checked to make sure that BOSS Alt Disk Install Boot Images and RTE were installed. And then in this case, I'm basically check, clicking on Install Makes This Be on an alternate disk. So the plan would be to take a Makes This Be image and to install it on my alternate disk which is going to be HDisk 1 in this particular case. So here you can see it prompted me for the target disk, which is HDisk 1. I then have to point it at the device or image name. So I pointed it to the Makes This Be image I want to install from. And I, I can add, add an image data file if I want. I didn't need one because it wasn't mirrored. I told it not to set the boot list and I wanted verbose output. We'll then see it running and it will do things like create a whole bunch of logical volumes on the new disk called like alt underscore hd5 hd6 etc and then you'll see it restoring the makes this be image onto that disk and then finally it will end and hopefully say okay when it's done if we run lspv you'll see there's a root vg but now there's an alt instance root vg on h disk one if I check my boot list, you can see it's still set to HDisk 0. And then down the bottom here, I'm just showing you the three phases that it goes through. The first one where it basically creates the new volume group, creates all the file systems, etc., and restores the root VG data to that. Phase two is where it runs customizations, installs updates, etc. And then the last bit is where it unmounts everything and varies off the alt root and root VG, etc. While the process is happening, you can actually run LSPV-L against the two H disks, and what you'll see is the different file systems. So root VG, which is my H to zero, isn't going to change. But if I'm looking at H disk one, you can see that basically the file systems that I have on my root VG are over on my new disk, but they've got slash alt underscore inst in front of them. And at the end, it's going to vary altered's root VG offline, so all those file systems on HDisk 1 will end up being unmounted. Now, let's say you realize that you forgot to change something in, I don't know, inetd.com or resolve.com or something before you took the clone, and you don't really want to go through the whole process of recloning and redoing the update. Well, one of the things you can do is you can wake up that alternate disk and then you can edit files over there. So you can use alt disk install or more commonly now we would use alt root vg up dash capital W. So it says wake up that disk. It will then go and mount all those file systems. 
So if you needed to change um, Etsy hosts, for instance, you would edit slash alt underscore inst slash etc slash hosts, make your changes, save it, and then you can put the disk back to sleep with the alt root vg op dash capital S, and it will basically unmount all those file systems and vary the volume group back offline. So it is one way that if there are some differences with the with the new system that you need to add that you forgot to do before you took the clone, you can now go in and edit them. And this is just showing you what the output of a df-g might be while the clone is still awake. So you can see all the slash alt slash alt admin, etc. file systems, as well as the normal ones. So this is a couple examples of alt disk copy. The one at the bottom, where I'm just copying to hdisk2, literally copies root vg across, doesn't change the boot list, doesn't make any changes to the content. The very top example, where I'm doing alt disk copy dash v dash b to hdisk1, and I'm giving it a file set, and I'm telling it to do some updates. Basically, what that will do, it'll copy the current root vg, which in this case was at 7300, to hdisk1. It then's going to go look and slash updates, and it will find the updates and put them on to bring this LPAR to 730001. And, and then I've got the dash capital B, so it shouldn't set the boot list to boot from HDisk1. But again, as I've said, you should always check that. So this lets you copy the running system and apply maintenance in one step. And then afterwards, you can uh, boot from the, the new disk. And you should see the the old root VG literally named old underscore root VG. You can remove it later or you can simply export it and clone over it, depending on what you want to do. And down the bottom here, I have the link to the alt disk copy command. So we've already been through this example earlier, and this was of migrating a 7.1 makes the speed of 7.2 using NIM ADM. A couple of things I wanted to mention. The one problem I did run into was there was a typo in our onetd.conf where somehow it got split over two lines, one of the lines, and it caused the resulting makes this be that was converted to drop literally over 2,000 file sets. So when we tried to boot from that makes this be, it was a mess. So I highly recommend that you make sure that you check a knit tab and onetd.conf and just make sure that they're very pristine and clean. Because if there's any errors in them, it will impact your converted makes this be or your migration. And then, as I said, it is going to set the boot list. So if you aren't planning on rebooting that migrated image immediately, make sure that you set the boot list back to the original root VG. I'm just going to touch on multiboss here because it's not something I tend to use. I find it too confusing. Basically, what multiboss allows you to do is to have a second root VG effectively on the same disk as your original root VG. So it creates a standby base operating system that boots from its own boot logical volume. And one of the reasons this came about was because when people were using direct H disks, you know, you get an 800 gig H disk and who needs an 800 gig root VG? So by, by putting a second boss instance on there, you could do the kind of copying etc and cloning that we've talked about but nowadays most people are booting from san it's just your vio servers that are on um, internal disks and so you can get custom sized san disks so like i said i don't tend to use multiboss i find it confusing but it is something that you do have in your toolkit if you choose to take advantage of it now you can also use nim to install and support and restore your VIO servers. Again, NIM has to be at the highest level. So if your VIO server now is at 4.1.0.21, your NIM server has to be at 7.3.2.2. In the README for each level of the VIO server, it tells you the minimum level your NIM master has to be at. So that's a good thing to check. So basically, you can copy the MAXIS-B image off of the ISO onto your NIM master. And so I normally create a base directory um, and then I use loop mount to mount the ISO image. Just be aware that when you're dealing with VIO server ISO images, 
you have to use the dash v udfs not cdfs they're in a really weird format so i mounted over a directory called slash cd rom i then copy that makes this b image and give it an and give it a name with, which is more meaningful to me and then i copy everything on that cd into my power vm base directory because i'm going to use that to create my spot later on i unmount my cd rom and i copy that makes its b image into nim images and then i'm going to build the makes this b resource which is just a standard makes this b resource and now i'm going to define the spot and that spot is actually created from the makes this b not from the directory i created earlier so here i define the spot i point it at the makes this b and i give it a location to write it out to check it and and do an ls nim minus l on it to make sure it's showing the right information um, you can also copy the BOSSense data from the DVD or ISO image and create a BOSSense resource just for VIO servers. And now I can use BOSSense to do Maxis B installs, etc., etc., for VIO servers. In terms of backing up your VIO servers, there are several different kinds of backups. The first thing is you need to back up your virtual resources separately. So that's all your VFC maps, that kind of thing. And that is done with the VIOSBR command. So you can back it up. Um, in this case, I'm backing it up to slash temp slash VIOSABK up BR. Um, or I can back it up to an NFS mounted file system. Um, once I've take, taken a backup, I can view the backup and what's in it. And if you just run VIOSBR dash backup, it's going to put it in, I think it's slash home slash p admin slash CFG backups, I believe. And if you look here, you'll see that you can actually set your VIOS bar to automatically back up. I set my system up so that it backs up my virtuals every day and it keeps the last seven. So that's what this line is doing. The VIOSBR dash backup dash file VIO1 dash VIO backup. That's the name of it. The frequency is daily, num files is seven, and it will put those in slash home slash padmin slash CFG backups. You can actually check them there. And it will also put an entry in cron tab so you can look at roots cron tab and you should see them. I always use my, my slash backups or slash user local backups is usually an NFS export from my NIM server and I then will use backup iOS to back up my VIO server and there's two different kinds of backups you can do you could just do a regular backup iOS that will create a NIM resources tar package and that can be used to clone VIO servers and is typically used from the HMC or you could take a full makes this be backup and actually tell it that it's a dash makes this be it will then take a full so makes this be backup that you can use your NIM server to restore from and I think it came in at version 9 950 but there's the ability now from your HMC to back up your VIO server virtuals and your VIO server to the HMC I would just caution you about doing that because you don't have a lot of space on your HMC to store those backups so if you have like lots of servers and VIO servers on one HMC, you're not going to be able to back them all up there. I highly recommend using a NIMS server with some storage for doing all your backups too. These are a bunch of different NIM specific useful links. They're all quite old and that's primarily because there's been nothing done about updating the documentation for NIM. It hasn't changed significantly since it came out but I did provide you the link for the NIM install manager um, for AIX 7.3. So that should be the latest and greatest information. And here I've provided you with the links to the current HMC scanner and to the alt disk, alt root VG, et cetera, commands so that you actually can figure out the syntax. And this slide has some links to some articles and recordings, et cetera, that I've made. On Tech Channel, there's a more recent article which is actually on adventures with NIM ADM that you might find helpful if you're planning to use NIM ADM. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope you found this useful and you should be able to find the handout at the link that's on this page. 
So I wish you all the best and have fun adventuring with NIM. Thank you.